Enjoy the Ravi Crystal Petri Consult. So inspiring. Hello, and thank you for joining me for another episode of 60 Minutes With. I'm your host, Crystal Petrie. Today, I am very excited because I'm jumping into the world of art and art history and all things beautiful with color, something that I know very little about. But as you know, as my listener and my viewer, my podcast is all about being educated. Today, I have Dr. Stephanie Chadwick, and she's going to educate us on art and art history. So thank you so much for joining the podcast, Dr. Uh, Chadwick. Well, thanks, Crystal, for inviting me. I really appreciate it. It's a fun opportunity. Thank you. So let's just jump right into it. Okay. You are a associate professor and department chair of art history of Lamar University in Beaumont, Texas, correct? So tell me a little bit about that. Uh, yes, so actually, uh, I am an art historian and associate professor of art history. Mm -hmm. uh, the department is the Department of Art and Design. So it's okay. kind of interesting because even though I'm an art historian, focusing more on the history of art and sort of right. current practices in art, uh, most of the people in the department are studio artists and designers. And all, most of our students, well, I would say about half of our students are art studio majors with different kinds of concentrations in different areas like drawing, painting, sculpture, uh, printmaking, photography. Um, and then we also have uh, graphic designers here too. It's about half of our students are graphic designers. So they're actually, uh, I think we don't actually offer an art history major here. So the art historians here, the two of us, we support the artists. Oh! <laughs> Long okay. answer. No, that was perfect. <laughs> so all of your students are creatives. Yeah. As yeah. they're called these days, yes. creatives, yeah. which is wonderful. That's great, yeah. Yes. Now, tell me a little bit about the art program, the art okay. building, because as we were talking about earlier, I graduated from Lamar University in Beaumont, Texas, and this is my first time yeah. ever stepping foot in this building. Yeah. So tell me about some things that you guys offer here. Yeah, well, and if you have time afterwards, I'd be happy to give you a tour because there's a lot of fun spaces in this building. Yeah, um, I actually hear that quite a bit, and uh, we are working to change that to the best of our ability. Um, so we, okay, so we're the Department of Art and Design, and I mentioned we have about half of our students uh, working in studio and the other half graphic design. We, I should have mentioned, though, we also do have... Um, classes we want to promote more and a, and a whole degree in art education for people who want to be art teachers, which okay. is fantastic, you know, because uh, those teachers go out into the community and then they're working with students all around Southeast Texas. But what I think is really great about our department, in addition to the fact that we have really amazing studio spaces, uh, also our graphic design labs, we have a lot of high-tech equipment, 3D printers, um, you know, we have uh, just amazing lab spaces that the students can use, digital drawing tablets, things like that. Uh, a lot of our students, you know, they're working in both traditional hand skills, but also very much in the, the digital world. Um, and by hand skills, you mean like what I would consider like drawing, yeah. sketching? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, um, but then we're also right next door to the Dishman Art Museum, and we were talking a little before the interview about how there's so many great events, not just in this department or at the Art Museum, but in the whole College of Fine Arts. So our department is in the College of Fine Arts and Communication mm -hmm. here at Lamar, and there's just fun things to do here all the time because the Dishman Art Museum has art openings regularly. They usually have a few every semester. And those are great. You know, you come in and you just have some food, look at art, meet people around the community. It's a fun thing to do. But um, we also have artists um, and designers come and give talks. And I like that you use that more, you know, mm -hmm. kind of more um, open term, creatives, because that's an interesting and important thing. You know, a lot of times we have people from uh, all careers and, you know, sort of all facets of life who may be involved in art in some way, who want to come and talk about that with us or share their experiences. But also people can go to uh, musical performances, the Department of Music and Theater and Dance. They have oh, performances in all those areas regularly here. So I think it's a fun place just to come if you're looking for something to do in Beaumont right. or Southeast Texas. Yeah. Now those events, the musicals, the theater performances, the art openings, 
are they available to the community and students at Lamar University? Yes, most of those events are open to the public and, um, and anyone can come. I mean, uh, so I think it's a, it's a really fantastic thing. And also, I think since COVID too, it's just been a process of getting students to re kind of realize that they can do these fun things again, you know, because for quite a while people were, you know, things were pretty low key right. and, and uh, but I think, I think we've been going strong for a while now and we're starting to see more and more students come out when we do exhibitions, when we do things. And what is the price for that? Is there a price oh. for the community and a separate price for the students here at Lamar University? Oh. Great question. Yeah, so um, a lot of the things on in our college are just totally free. So whenever we have an art opening, that is free and open to the public. Yeah. Uh, when, and a lot of times the artists who is exhibiting work there will come and give a talk or someone else will give a talk. Mm -hmm. um, and then even sometimes when we just invite people in to give, uh, maybe to give a talk for the public, that's always open to the public for free as well. Uh, our theater department, there is a charge for the, the plays, to go mm -hmm. see a play, but it's actually a pretty nominal charge. I mean, it's a very affordable thing, and for that, students do get a discount price on it. On top of the affordable price, they yeah, get a, they get a, a discount. discount. Yeah. And then, the, I think almost, I think all the music performances are free, I, I, I really do. So, there's, I mean, there's like all kinds of different performances, too. I think the big hit is our, when they do a jazz concerts, you know, everyone yes. loves that. and. Sometimes that brings in a lot of people. Yes. Okay, so for all of you broke college students, yeah, exactly, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You now yeah. know about some free events That's right. here yeah. at Lamar University in Beaumont, Texas. And I'll also make sure and put like phone number, the address right. yeah. of the department so people will know where they yeah. can find all of this amazing stuff. Fantastic. And I yeah, I totally agree with that. Totally free and fun. But also a great chance to, to network a lot of the times because, you know, a lot of times people from, again, from all facets of our community life will be coming to some of these events. So some of them are also a great opportunity just to, to meet people or to meet other students on campus. For of the creatives. Yeah, exactly. Of the In, creatives. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you are a creative, at least I would consider you a creative. When did you know you wanted to have a career in art? Because normally that's not... At least for me, it's not like the first thing that you think of, like, oh, I'm going to work in art, I'm going to have a career in art. So when did you realize that this is what I want to do with my life? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question as well. Um, so I, I'll try to give a, not too long of an answer on that, but it wasn't a direct journey for me. I do think for a lot of our studio um, students, it, it's always been a passion. And for me, I also like to draw and paint. I especially love to paint. And so when I was younger, it was a passion of mine to do. And I still do it as a hobby mm -hmm. now. Um, but I think uh, kind of like we were talking about earlier, you know, um, it wasn't clear to me that there would be career paths. And so I didn't follow that as my career. So I was actually a non-traditional student who went to a community college while I was working full time and taking care of my family. And I, I didn't know that I was going to do an art degree, actually. I knew I loved it, and I just wasn't sure exactly. I was just trying to kind of get more college courses in. Right. And at a certain point, I decided, you know, this is my passion, and this is what I love, so I want to go in this direction, rather than just getting a degree to fit a career track that maybe wasn't my preferred career track. Mm -hmm. I decided to do a career change. <laughs> and um, I thought about doing a studio degree, and I ended up deciding that, for me, I just really enjoy looking at art and learning about it and talking about it. So for me, art history is perfect because that's what, that's what we do, basically. We look at art and talk about it. Did anyone introduce you to art and say, look at this, or bring you to art museums and kind of planted that seed in you? Yeah, actually, I can say that was very much the case. So I feel very blessed to have creatives in my family. So um, my mother and my grandmother and my uncle were all... They all worked in some kind of creative process. My grandmother did a lot of pen and ink drawings and watercolor painting and photography. So that was nice. And my uncle was an architect and my mom paints. So that was great. But I will also say that I'm a big advocate for arts in the public schools because the school system that I was in was one of very few that I'm aware of that actually did a lot to make sure students got to go, like we got to go 
to museums. We got to go, you know, to see performances. And if we couldn't go, sometimes they would bring a performance to our school. They would bring, you know, a musical performance or some kind of dance performance to our school. So that really helped a lot because, you know, um, kids really, and I, I think there's a lot, a lot of outreach in Southeast Texas mm -hmm. that, that does provide students with that kind of opportunity. So I feel very fortunate to be here now because I right. feel like uh, it has been really an amazing surprise since I moved here from Houston about eight years okay. ago to see how much our arts community really is reaching out to students in schools because it really gives them that idea that, hey, this could be part of my life forever, you know? It really does. Yeah. And I wonder, and I was just kind of shaking my head, like, they were very intentional, the school that you went to, yeah. were very intentional with mm -hmm. introducing the students to art, and not just introducing, but continuing yeah. that. And I wonder, I don't know if they still do that. I know they introduce it, they do a yeah. great job of introducing I don't know if they're still as intentional with yeah. continuing it. And they, it could be, you know, I'm not immersed in the yeah. art world. So that's not something that I would uh, exactly just know about, but I feel like maybe not mm -hmm. as much anymore. And we'll actually talk about like school and art a little bit more because I really want to get your, your thoughts on that. But can you explain to me what is art history? Yeah, yes, I can. And I, and I, I will say just, um, and maybe we'll come back to this too, but mm -hmm. I will say that um, I think a lot of, sorry, there's something <laughs> flying. I think a lot of um, the outreach is actually being also initiated by the art institutions like the museum, the symphony. They have people who are really just kind of getting involved with making sure students know. Okay. And then in terms of the, um, the art museum, that relates directly to that art history question. So what is art history? Yeah, and also I should say it could be a lot of different things. Okay. Um, which is not not an easy answer. But um, I think in general, uh, that idea that art historians, they are interested in looking at art. We're interested in looking at art and learning about it. And, and then we do research so that we can write about it and talk about it. So we teach classes, we give, give uh, public talks. Uh, I'll be going to a conference later this month where we're going to talk about artists who use um, art in the environment to make statements about the environment. So there's a lot of different things we can do, but we're also... I think for me, one of the most important things is that we can learn. We can through art and objects. We it's kind of a way. It's a lens, really, to learn about different historical periods and different cultures and what ways of life uh, may have been like in a lot of different points in time, and and, and that's a really fun. Thing. If someone wants to talk about art and study art, write about art, is there a degree plan for art history? Yeah, there is. So we don't offer an art history degree at Lamar. I should say we do offer an art history minor, and that is a good okay. thing because people from any discipline can take that, can, can claim that minor. And uh, so far we've had people mainly in uh, the history department who are interested, which uh, we've had other departments as well. That makes a lot of sense, though, because part of what we're doing in art history is we're looking at history and we're learning about the context. And so... Um, it makes a lot of sense if someone is doing a history degree, they may want to also look at the images that may go along with that period in time. Uh, but there are, uh, there is an art history degree. You can do a bachelor's, a fine, uh, uh, a bachelor's, uh, BA, bachelor's of arts in art history. And I should say sometimes art history departments are in the fine arts and sometimes they're in the humanities. So we, we kind of float around in different departments. Um, and, and people can also do graduate degrees, master's or PhD. And so there's, a, there's different levels depending on what someone wants to do, if someone's interested in maybe becoming a museum curator or someone maybe wants to teach um, at a college level, they would pursue uh, the advanced degrees. The minor in art history that's um, available here at Lamar University in Beaumont, Texas, is that in the art department yeah. or is that, so it's in the art it department? It is. Yeah, okay. so at Lamar, our structure is that we, we have uh, the studio and design degrees as the major. And then we also offer this minor in art history, and that's open to our majors or to anyone on campus. We also have a photography major, which is kind of cool because, again, people in history or sociology, there may be different fields where it makes a lot of sense to, to look at, Im especially images, you know, thinking about the kinds of things creative people make or the kinds of images that you see when you're exploring a culture. If someone wants to do art history, and this is on the backdrop that in my personal opinion, 
college is expensive and I feel it like is, it's yeah. getting more expensive yes. each year. Studying art history, becoming an art major, is that expensive? Like, is that an expensive degree plan? Yeah, I mean, you know, the costs associated with it are pretty much the cost associated with any degree. So, especially for, for Texas residents, our tuition is very affordable, and then people would have in-state tuition on that. So, I think that's one issue. But I think the other thing that's very much related to that is that question of what is the career path going to be for that, right? Mm -hmm. To make that to show the value of earning that degree in terms of monetary as well as a cultural value or personal enrichment. And I think that is something that's very important for, for educators, for, for all of us who are educators to do, is to make sure that students who are interested in pursuing an art degree or at another institution, maybe where someone's doing an art history degree, uh, what are the career opportunities that are going to be open exactly. for you. And there actually are a lot more than people might realize. Especially in graphic design, there are many, many. That is very much geared toward working for clients. Um, but in the studio degrees as well, uh, we have students right now, I should say that one of their most popular topics right now is illustration. We're working on a, a concentration in that area now as well because a lot of our students want to do things like character art where they're developing oh, yeah. characters yeah. that can be used like in, for movies in, and yes. comic books. Yes, and they're yes. looking at internships, you know, like with Disney and with places where oh, they can maybe awesome. develop into a, 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 a real career pathway that could be very economically <laughs> rewarding as well as yes. they just have fun doing it, right? And so a lot of our students are interested in animation, we have students who are interested in game design as well. That's huge right now. Yeah, so in game design, that it, on the art side of that, the art and design side of that, a lot of times it could be they're interested in those characters, but we also have people who are interested in creating the environments. So the spaces, like if you think about, I'm not, I'm not a big gamer, but mm -hmm. you know, if you think about how when you're looking at a video game, you know, the way the user is kind of interfacing with that virtual space, you know, yes. so they're, they're thinking about how to design those spaces and what kind of, you know, graphics will be in those, will create that background. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also do have um, people who are starting to work in virtual reality and augmented reality, so. The VRs. Yes, there's, yeah. there are pathways. And then for art history specifically, I'm just going to use as an example of one of the students that, well, we have two students actually right now who are doing degrees related to art history. Mm -hmm. One, um, it, it, both of them graduated in the last couple of years. Both of them have done internships with local museums, uh, especially at the museum, uh, the art museum here on campus, the Dishman Art Museum, and then also the Art Museum of Southeast Texas. Um, one of these students uh, ended up also uh, deciding they want to go ahead and not just maybe work at an administrative level within a, an art institution, such as a museum or gallery, but they might want to do something more like a curatorial kind of position where they're helping to organize art exhibitions. Mm -hmm. There's also positions as registrars where people are digitizing collections to make them available to people all over the world. Um, so there are avenues like that. And then for those, though, for people who are wanting to go kind of further and further into that realm, we really try to start talking to them about thinking about graduate school and how even though that is an additional cost sometimes, mm -hmm. not always, a lot of graduate programs actually offer a lot of funding. That's something not everyone knows. Right. But we try so to you should have told me. <laughs> I know. We try to help students to apply and you know some programs have funding available, some don't. But the idea is we try to help our students with professional development skills and to start looking around so that they can get a program that may offer them funding or that may offer them internships. So right now we have one student who's doing um, a master's program in Houston and she's doing an internship at the Manil Collection in Houston, which could really help her get Is that an art museum in that Houston? That is. It's one of the top, one of my favorite, I want to most recommend art museums and it's free and open to the public. And what is the name of it? It's called the Manil Collection. Okay. And it's in the museum district. It is so fun and it has kind of like park area all around it and it's just a fun place if, if you just ever have, even if you don't have a lot of time and you just want to check it out, you know, since it's free, you can just pop in and <laughs> see what's going on. Uh, so we have one student who's in a grad program doing an internship there. I feel confident she'll be able to get some kind of a museum position. Mm -hmm. We also have another student who decided she was an art educator, learning how to be an art teacher. And she decided she was becoming more interested in her museum internships. 
So she applied and got into NYU. And she just graduated from NYU with a master's in museum studies. And she did, she did an internship at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. She's going to get a job anywhere she wants to. Anywhere. <laughs> so there are, there are opportunities, and I think it's our role as mentors and educators to help our students find those pathways so they can do their passion. It really sounds like even though art may be expensive, the degree may be expensive along with every other oh, college degree, yeah, yeah. Um, there is a high return on investment in this degree plan and in this field. Yes, there can be. Again, I think it has a lot to do with um, passion, determination, mm -hmm. hard work, but also mentoring. I mean, again, in our program, we try to make sure that we're mentoring our students to help them see and be able to take advantage of those opportunities, but also just to get them starting to think about professional development, networking. And we have courses in professional development um, that really help a lot in, in those areas. And uh, I think something else you said is important. You know, we offer a four-year degree here, but we also, we love to talk to transfer students. And I myself went to a community college, and that saved me a lot of money, you know, yeah. going to that first two years. Um, but also, I think sometimes when when people are going to a community college like I did, we aren't even always sure we're going to go to the four-year degree because I already had a, a pretty well-paying job at the time, at least decent paying mm -hmm. career track I was on. Uh, but what happened with me is just taking those steps, I started to fall in love with what I was doing in my classes more. And that's what made a difference for me. So it really is, you know, there's a lot of factors to consider, including that expense. But I think if someone has a passion and they know they want to spend the rest of their lives doing something that really, is really meaningful to them and that they believe that's going to be somewhere in the arts mm -hmm. in general, I think our college is a great place to go. And I think we have a lot of very mentoring faculty here who, can, who really help students. Well, they need to put you on a commercial. <laughs> <laughs> you have sold me. They need okay, to put you on the Moore University. Have. Commercial, Dr. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Well, I should say, you know, I wasn't a traditional student. I was mm -hmm. a I was a working person. Um, I had s small children when I went back to school, mm -hmm. and so, um, and we have students all age ranges here too. I mean, and that's what I I personally think that's a cool thing. I mean, I did my undergraduate in Houston. Mm -hmm. um, I liked being in classes with people from all over the world and all different age ranges because it really just you know opens your eyes to a lot of different perspectives, and so. I kind of miss taking glasses now. I think I'm going to try to sit in on some of them just because, you know. Now that's something you don't hear every day. No, Somebody's because we're so used to trying to get to the end of it, right? So yes. we can get to the next thing. And I think that's, yeah. And I'm really, I'm so busy. I say I'm going to do that. I don't know when I'm going to actually do it. But I have had professors who, who do go back and at least sit in on classes or, or, or maybe an art historian like me could do some studio work and go back to drawing, maybe take some... Drawing. I had a professor in Houston who did that. She went back and she was an art historian. She went back. She said, "You know, I want to do more drawing." She went, cool. To oh. classes. Yeah. If someone wants to major in art history, mm -hmm. is there a certain character traits that that person needs to have, or maybe as the professor, mm -hmm. you're looking for mm -hmm. these things in a person? Um. You know, I'm not sure about that. I'm actually not sure about the answer to that one. Mm -hmm. I think that um, the, the, the students who are going to gravitate toward it are going to be people who are thinking, you know, visually. They're interested in looking at images and looking at objects. But I, would, I think today, right here we are, right, in 2023 now, right. I mean, our culture is more visually oriented than it ever has been, ever. So I think most people are we're looking at images all day long right on our screens so that's that's one thing I think most of the things that would would be kind of the necessary ingredients are things they're skills that can be learned right yeah. but if someone has an interest that I think that's the, the key right and a lot of times people become interested so one of the things I you said I should be in a commercial and I think one of the, that's probably because as uh, one of two art historians in this department, I often feel like part of my job in my classes is to um, convince my students that they need to take my classes. Like, why do I need art history? A lot of times, uh, especially people maybe in their sophomore, you know, freshman and sophomore, they may be thinking, hey, I just want to make art. Why do I need this <laughs> art history class? Yes. I like making art. That's what I want to do. I don't need to learn about all this other 
history. But what starts to happen, and it's fun for me when I see it happening, at least with a lot of our students, is the more of these classes they take, there's, go there's always going to be at least one or two that really resonates with them. And like, so I'm teaching late modern and contemporary art right now. Okay. And that starts off with art since World War II, and you kind of see, oh, in the United States people are starting to work more abstractly. Well, most of the viewers didn't like it at all. They thought it was horrible art. They didn't consider it art at all. They mm -hmm. didn't think anyone could do that, right? And so, but then there were certain people who became interested in that. And then what we do in this class, though, is we talk about so many different art movements. We start to go into the 1960s, and you start to see, like, the civil rights era. You start to see the feminist era. You start to see how a lot of visual artists were part of those movements, and it was partly through that visual art that those movements went into the consciousness of, you know, in addition to political demonstrations and right. all the kinds of things, the, the really hard work that was going on with that, you start to see that a lot of times it was artists who were opening doors. It was artists who were doing things that were getting attention visually that was changing people's minds. And so sometimes our students, they start to go, they come up to me and say, can I change my paper topic? I really want to write about this person, you know, because yeah. they were doing this really exciting work that to them seems really like one of the most important things that may have happened in the 20th century, right? And they didn't realize art was such a big part of it, maybe. So um, I think I'm going far away from the question no, you asked fine. me now. <laughs> but um, uh, remind me of the <laughs> character traits. The character traits. Yeah, so um, I do think for any, for any college class, mm -hmm. um, and I had an interdisciplinary undergraduate degree, so I was okay. doing like humanities, uh, like you know, literature, philosophy, communications. Mm -hmm. I think for any degree, what's going to be important is just kind of tuning in to how you're empowered to kind of create your own path and how you may take some classes that you don't like, right? You may, we don't all like all that work that we did past some of those classes. But I think what happens is when you start to see um, students develop a work ethic, so if you combine that work ethic with the passion that you have, you really are unstoppable. But I think if you're not having a passion for that actual degree, oh, I personally think that's time to reevaluate. Is there another, is there some other yes. course that you've taken maybe at your university that you, you're really fascinated by? Mm -hmm. and, and if so, <clears throat> does that in any way relate to the degree you're in? And if not, are there things you can do to maybe bring those interests together so that you have that, that passion? I don't like to say switch degrees, but you know, if you're That's really, what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, that's a tricky one. You know, yeah. I know people have very strong reasons for doing the, the programs that they're in. Mm -hmm. But I know that also a lot of times when people are starting college, they're not yet sure what they want to do. Right. And, and you're 17, to 18. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, at that time. So yeah. it takes some time to figure it that's out. That's right. Yeah. It took me quite a while. <laughs> so, but yeah, I think that's the thing is, uh, I think. Uh, you know, any university should be a place where students can explore and find out what it, you know, what is their passion, and mm -hmm. maybe they have multiple interests. And I think, uh, especially now today, there's so many areas where you can combine interests. You know, uh, photography and sociology is one that comes to mind. Uh, people were talking about art and healthcare. There's a lot of art. Actually, that's interesting. Wow. Yeah, especially in Houston near the medical center, but even here on campus, there's some interest in you know, art therapy, um, but also just thinking creatively and doing something that, that feels, you know, there's sort of a creative um, channel, you know, that, that feels really rewarding for a lot of people. And, well, another thing I'll say as an art historian is a lot of art historians don't make art. I do, I like to make mm -hmm. art, but a lot of art historians feel like, you know, I'm a scholar, I'm not trained to make art, and sometimes people can get kind of scared of you know, like they're like, you know, I, I, what if my art isn't very good or something? And so I know in our studio classes, one of the things our professors do is they, they teach students about techniques and processes, but they also do critiques, which can be very, you know, yeah. you nervous. But they really try to, you know, cultivate an environment where the professor and the other students give each other important feedback, and then mm -hmm. they can kind of learn and grow from each other. But also, even even in classes where you're doing writing, you, you get maybe sometimes feedback from your professor or your peers. It helps you grow, and it helps you be able to kind of learn why you're doing what you're doing. And, and also, which artists maybe are influential to you, and, and, and how you might learn from your classmates or other artists working around in the community. I think there's a... 
a lot of room also for just interdisciplinary work too, where, where people are think, finding, like we were talking about uh, gaming, game mm -hmm. design, you know, art in computer science, yes. art in, you know, healthcare was the other one that came up. Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of, you know, we were talking with our community, we, the fine art and communication um, college, you know, the communication department has film they classes. Do. I yes. mean, that's really cool. It I mean, is. And some of our art students are interested in film, too, right? right? They're thinking about animation, they're thinking about film. And so we're talking about how do we get more of our students kind of doing collaborative projects with each other. As an art history, as an art historian, mm -hmm. what makes an art piece worth studying? What makes you look <laughs> at it and say, that's it, that's the piece that I'm going to study, I'm going to write about, I'm going to give a lecture about. Is there, mm -hmm. and I guess my question is, what's the it factor? Okay, that is a good and very <laughs> difficult question. Um, well, I will say a lot of the art I teach is art that people wouldn't necessarily like to look at. Maybe it's not considered beautiful or aesthetically engaging, maybe. Um, so there's a lot of different reasons to look at art. And one of the things, actually, this is a funny reason of why I became an art historian. Because, you know, I was thinking about a studio degree when I was in college. When I was a non-traditional student in college, I thought about doing a studio degree, and one of the things that I kept wondering is why are why are some artists making art that seems so weird mm -hmm. and so bizarre? Even thinking about Pablo Picasso in the early twentieth century, like why did people think this was so great? What was the deal? You know, exactly. and so I started to ask this question so often that I ended up becoming an art historian. Mm -hmm. But I, I find that some of the most interesting art to study is art that I don't. Really? I know, yeah, that's true. I mean, I, like yin yang. Yeah, I mean, I love to look at beautiful art, uh, but even ideas like what do we mean by beauty and who, yes. how do we think about that, and yes. even how do we come up with our own? Like people often think their own ideas about beauty are all their own, but in reality, how much of that is coming from cultural practices? How much yes. of that is coming from television shows and yes. movies and oh, magazine covers are a big one. Yes. You know, airbrushed figures on magazine covers yes. and who comes up with these standards of beauty, and, and how did we decide that was what was important. Yeah, exactly. So we talk about a lot of things like that in class, and we might take a very beautiful painting of a Renaissance nude, maybe, of mm -hmm. a female nude from the Italian Renaissance, very beautiful, be well-executed, beautiful painting, but then we will also talk about that, and then we'll start kind of digging in deep, drilling into that, and talking about, okay, now, I mean, why is this considered beautiful, and who was the audience for this? I mean, you know, was it primarily people in different Italian, you know, city-states, and is that why maybe these figures look particularly a certain wow. way? Yes. <laughs> you know, and then this becomes the standard for a lot of different art schools, and then later it sort of goes, you know, and then of course colonialism, and then next thing you know, these are standards of beauty are kind of now they're still in our magazine covers, yes, you know, so yes. I think we can do a lot with uh, some, some of the study of art history will go where we're looking at an art specifically in its own context, mm -hmm. and then other times we'll look and see how do, does that echo maybe and still affect us today in ways that we might not be consciously aware of, and so I think we can, um, we, we can through that study of art history, uh, even talking about what makes an art worth, like what does make an art worthy to yes. study, or um, how does that relate to, like what do we mean by value, like monetary, mm -hmm. cultural, what, which different ways can we think about that? Sometimes those lead to the most interesting conversations that take us to explore different contexts about, you know, who, you know, not only what do, what do I, so often I don't get to necessarily just choose either what I teach. A lot of times I'm teaching books. Uh, classes from the art history textbooks. Okay. So, uh, I mean, I write my classes, but a lot of the images, I need to kind of, my responsibility partly is to make sure that our students understand who are the canonical figures they need to know. And also, like for studio artists and art and graphic designers, I just kind of tell them, even if you don't think art history is that important, if you're going to become a professional artist and you want to have your own practice, you need to be able to walk into a museum and recognize these are the really big important artworks that other artists are going to know and be talking about and maybe you'll see quotations of it even in their work. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Sometimes we can even see it in TV shows and movies and things. Something from a, an actual artwork, a painting. And it helps to kind of know because a lot of times there's some meaning behind that. Why did they? Why was this particular image chosen to be quoted here mm -hmm. or there? So, uh, yeah, I think that it, it's just thinking about what is worthy of study, when we look at the, these are the big canonical images, these are the images that these art academies for hundreds of years have de deemed worthy, now let's talk about who got to make that decision. Again, it's the same question like with the standards of beauty. Okay, so we can look at that and we can talk about this is, these are the canonical works, but then we can also deconstruct that a little bit and go back and rewind and say, okay, now... <laughs> Let's talk about how there was all this other art being made that wasn't actually being looked at. Yes. <laughs> and maybe someone was saying that wasn't worthy of study, and why not? You know? mm -hmm. Or a lot of my work actually takes me to um, anthropology or ethnographic museums, and we'll talk about, okay, so these are museums that are, their mission is to collect objects that represent particular cultural practices. Okay, okay. well, why are some of those in art museums and other ones are not, you know, and who's making those decisions. And I yes. think we're kind of fortunate to be in, living in a time period where all of those um, practices are being examined and really tried to be opened up to where they're more accessible mm -hmm. to a lot more, you know, people around the world. We can look at art now anywhere in the world, right? We right. can go on the internet and just, we can see like, what is in this museum in this country or that country? And, you know, we can talk about how those objects got there and, and kind of what decisions went into that. So. Why is it said that when you look at art, you're looking at the world that you live in? Oh, well, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of truth to that, but mm -hmm. then that's also kind of a, uh, it could be a rabbit hole too, right? Because okay. a lot of the art we look at is very, like we could look at art that's fantastic fantastical. Like I, some of the artworks in my office, we, they're not on the camera, but you know, you can see the backgrounds are kind of, you know, they're like a, almost a fantasy background. So in a way that's taking us out, out of our reality, right? It's, it's like a window into some other Oh, I see reality. what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. But on the other hand, I do think it reflects the world around us because the fact that it exists it shows people are interested in it. So for example, fantasy art is a big category. I mean, and especially when you're thinking about also graphic novels and, you know, uh, there's, that's kind of also an insight into our culture. So like, uh, I think artworks, whether they're images like 2D representations, like paintings mm -hmm. or drawings, um, or whether they're sculpture or ceramics or some other, you know, kind of artwork, they also give us an idea like, what did that culture value, right? Like, what in value meaning not just necessarily monetarily, but like, what were people interested in, or also a lot of the art we study from the history, especially older, you know, going back hundreds of years, or even thousands of years, a lot of the art we see that, that, is, that still exists, you know, that maybe wasn't uh, in a material that would have, dis you know, degraded and not lasted so long, a lot of that art is um, spiritual, like religious art, right? Like cathedrals, you know, yeah. uh, pyramids, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's artwork, a lot of artwork um, has to, you know, gives us a lot of insights into what were the, the cultural practices and what did that particular culture value? What were they interested in? Okay. Yeah. I want to circle back to something you talked about earlier when you were saying that artists during the civil rights era, during the mm -hmm. feminist movement, artists really help move that that along and help bring about that change. Of course, we have the demonstrators and uh, lawmakers and mm -hmm. you know, law changes to also help that. But how is art mm -hmm. social justice? Yeah, well, I think there's many different ways that, there, that those relationships can exist. Mm -hmm. um, on a, a certain level, it could just be, you know, the fact that there are works being produced and circulating in culture, mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, images that can circulate. I mean, if you think about, well, I have a, okay, so I have a friend who is doing a talk on the Harlem Renaissance right now, mm -hmm. and we were looking at different artworks, and Aaron Douglas comes to mind. This is someone who was doing a lot of artwork. Is that a male or female? Uh, a male, I should say it's a male, yeah. Okay. It's a, for, so back in the 1920s and 30s, uh, doing a lot of works that were going on to, uh, illustrated journals, magazine covers, and kind of putting, you know, like the, the 
very early, right? The Harlem Renaissance, or, you know, 1920s, 1930s, putting that in the consciousness, not just, you know, in Harlem or in New York, but like all around the United States and in the world, right? Uh, be, you know, works that are circulating into Europe, other parts of the world. Um, and there, and the same thing was going on in the 60s. There were artists making things that were going on in magazines that were, you know, circulating around the United States, really putting a lot of imagery into the, the popular consciousness. Um, but then there also are artists who are actively going out and engaging in demonstrations. Um, and then in the 1960s, when things get really weird, I mean, things get really weird. I just tell my class, things are going to get really weird now. <laughs> We're going to see a lot of weird art. Um, a lot, that's, in the 1960s, a lot of people also started to do performance art, and so they would sometimes do performances that would call attention to either, you know, social injustices in some way. A lot of times there would be artists who would also be talking about, like, why aren't there more women being represented? Uh, there was a, a great an question. activist group in the 1980s uh, who was just going out, and they were going out and um, putting all kinds of, like they were making billboards and flyers. Um, they were, you know, saying like, hey, why are all the nudes in these museums women and why aren't there very many women artists being depicted here? Yes. But then another thing, one of the things we talk about in our classes is I think some of the ways that artists started to help, I think, just make a more inclusive culture is that you can just start to see, especially in, as you go into the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, you start to see that artists, they start to say, hey, galleries and museums should start representing more people who are making artwork. Not just this one group of people who happen to be white men, you know, who mm -hmm. happen to be friends with the curators or, you know, um, they start to they start to work in more and more inclusive groups, and they start to make their voices heard and their images to be seen to where they start to get more inclusion into in, into these spaces that become spaces that are seen. So, I think they just you know artists try to help in their own different kinds of ways, mm -hmm. and um, I I know we'll, we'll talk about this more later, but you know we have a couple of, we have more than a couple, we have several students here, but we have a couple who are doing great things to try to use their work now mm -hmm. to kind of, again, put, put just put images in, and a lot of times the art is meant to be thought-provoking. Sometimes it might be a little confusing, it might not make even a lot of sense when you look at it at first glance, but a lot of times then, if, um, if you start looking longer, you know, you start to kind of go, I wonder why this artist made the choice to put this in there. And then sometimes uh, you'll start to see a, a, a richer picture that involves, that does involve social concerns. Yeah. I want to pivot a little bit and talk about how art and creatives affect our kids. Hmm. So okay, it's yeah. said that art helps with self-esteem. Now, I'm sure mm -hmm. this is the case for everyone that wants to um, look at art and study art, but specifically I just want to talk about the children right now. Okay. It's stated that art and being creative helps with self-esteem, it helps with attitudes, like calming the attitude, yeah. it helps with anger and things like that. Why do you, why do you think art oh. is so important for children in that aspect? Uh, you know, I think that's really interesting, and I, I wasn't aware of some of those discussions, but they don't surprise me, because there, there, have, there is a history, actually, of um, an interest in the correlations between creative activity and mental health or well-being. Mm -hmm. And that, really, honestly, that really, there's a kind of a bizarre history of that that started um, in the mental health, like in psychology and psychiatric okay. practices. But um, there's a lot of current studies, too, where people are using art and healing, you know, like even with terminal cancer patients, uh, to do creative activities for a certain amount of time each day helps alleviate anxiety, uh, but also just to kind of, I think, and so when, coming back to your children, uh, question about children, I think all of those are very important at developmental stages, and I know that art teachers, I wish our art educator, Dr. Hyatt, was here. Um, Joanna Hyatt is our art education professor, and she's amazing. Mm -hmm. She talks with our students so much about how art and creative activity is so much an important part of, of your life, of your well-being, also of your social and political world. Uh, but you know, there's also a long history of artists who are interested in the art of children. 
a lot of modern art, you know, people will say like, oh, my child could do that or something. And it's not always true. <laughs> it's often it's not true at all. Because a lot of times that artist does a lot more. But the thing is, the reason artists were so interested in the art of children is because, you know, there's this idea that children, that all human beings, mm -hmm. they have some sort of impetus to create. And even if, even if you don't think of yourself, I don't know, I should ask, do you like to make art? I mean, because even if you don't. When I was a kid, okay. like, when I was a kid, I did. Okay. But, you know, as I got older, you know, this was something I was going to talk about. It yeah. seemed like the importance of art, yeah. being intentional about art within the schools, went away okay you know okay. so as you got older okay yeah. you know the emphasis on art was just like even with the teachers the principals it was just mm -hmm. like whatever well, that that's something i know a lot of us in this department always work to try to change mm -hmm. but yeah there's this idea that everyone and that's one thing i think too and it relates to one of your earlier questions about how does art you know kind of tell us about the world around us is that there is an idea that like all human beings are creative in some way, okay. and um, and all peoples and all cultures that I've ever heard of anywhere in the world, any time period, help all create. They create. We create things. People right. create, and so and when you're a child, you know, I think there's this real freedom where you feel like you can, you can just make art. You know, look what I did, mom. You know, and you're excited about it. And then as, sometimes as we get older, and sometimes in it could be our school setting or it could be other settings. You know. Um, you start to become more conscious of what uh, what those social settings are and whether people are going to approve of that work. So there's something very free and creative about art when you're a child. But also, to just continue working with kids and let them have a creative outlet can really be good in a number of ways. And even if that person's going to be a, a, a medical doctor or something totally unrelated to art, um, there are our museum studies that I have looked at for my own work. Mm -hmm. And these were working... Um, really uh i want to say k through six there are studies that go all the way k through 12 but a lot of times we're talking elementary junior high school students and um the nationalists there's two associations national associations of museums and they did these, these studies where they brought students into the museums where they could uh have guide you know guided tour where the museum curators and their job is to kind of know about all these objects and how they fit in their, their context, they would take these students, and they weren't making art, but what they were doing is just looking at art, walking around, talking about it. And then later, they were given tests, um, and, and this, there was a control group who wasn't looking at the art. Okay. And the, the kids who were going and looking at art and just, just talking about creative practices, they were scoring higher on a lot of critical thinking tests. Really? And I think it's kind of interesting because it kind of shows that, it, and I do think there's a lot of interest today in, in like hands-on learning. Mm -hmm. And in, when you're in a museum, like you're not allowed to touch at all. But, but it, there is a kind of hands-on in the sense that you're, you're physically engaging. You're walking around, you're looking, you're talking. And so then um, I think there are ways that making art can help people feel better emotionally. But also you mentioned confidence. And that's mm -hmm. why I think, I hadn't thought so much about the confidence, but I do think those museum studies about how students can do better with critical thinking, I think that would be a confidence builder. It, really, it is. Yeah, I think it, it would. It absolutely is. If a parent or grandparent or guardian has a child that's interested in art, that mm -hmm. loves art, how do they cultivate it and continue that to where, like what happened with me, you know, as I got older, yeah. I just, you know, yeah. it became less important to me. But if a parent has a child right now, that's loving art, that's loving to draw, that's always asking for like the art journals. Yeah, How yeah. do you continue to cultivate that mm -hmm. as they grow? You know, that's a great, um, that is a great question. And I think it's, it can be a tricky one. You know, today, especially a lot of times, you know, it's a two income family, parents mm -hmm. are working. Uh, it, it, it's not always easy, I don't think. But also sometimes people do just, I think, naturally gravitate toward other interests, right? So maybe even if you like making art as a child, sometimes someone's going to move away from that. Mm -hmm. That happened with me as well. And I think part of that was me just shifting gears to other mm -hmm. things. And I do think, I, I think also, even though I did go to a relatively strong school system, I still think part of it was the educational setting. Um, I will say, though, 
sometimes people can come back because I went years without doing anything and then one day I said, you know, I'm going to start making art again. And I felt so good when mm -hmm. I started doing it. It really is good, you know, it's good for my soul. And I heard one of our professors say that, you know, if art is your passion, you know, it's good for your soul. So even if you stop doing it for a while, you're going to come back to it. Okay. But also, I went to an artist talk at AMSET. Uh, was AMSAT. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I should know that. It was, it's the Art Museum of Southeast Texas. And when I first moved here, I was like, what is AMSAT? Yeah, <laughs> I was like, it took me a while. But it's a mouthful, Art Museum of Southeast Texas. Mm -hmm. Another great museum, fabulous. Uh, they specialize in the art of our region, the art of Texas, Southeast Texas, and nearby. It's also free and open to the public. And they have art openings, too. Mm -hmm. There's one coming up Friday night, this Friday night. And um, they, these openings they do periodically, and they're they're great as well. Uh, but there was an artist there who was talking about his love of art, and he said, I can't remember now if he said it was his mom or his grandma. I think it was his grandmother. He was saying he, um, you know, in his generation, he was talking about, and and, I, and we used this when I was in school too, the big writing tablets, you know. That oh had, yes. And he said that you know those things were expensive, and he was growing up in a rural area. They didn't have a lot of money, but he said that his family always made sure he had extra ones of those tablets. I know it makes me want to cry. <laughs> he said that, and then he would do those things. They used to have this. I don't know if that's still around, but they had this um, where you could draw a character and send it away, and they would tell you if they thought you were. Oh, talented to take a class. It used to be like in the TV guide or something. Okay. And he said he did that, you know, and his family, you know, were really encouraging for him and he started taking these art classes and then went on and earned an advanced degree and, you know, got students of his own. And, you know, so it's kind of, I think there's a lot of different ways parents can support their children. Mm -hmm. Whether it's just making sure they have tablets if they want to have it or, you know, and again, and, and this guy was saying like his family didn't have a lot of money for art supplies, but, um, you know, a lot of times there's things you can do, you know, there's inexpensive alternatives that students can use. Um, and then also, you know, I think to try to ask them, you know, what kinds of things they are doing at, at their school for art, because uh, maybe there's a lot of great activities. There's a lot of great art teachers mm -hmm. in Southeast Texas, and I know a lot of them were our graduates. <laughs> oh, but they want, they really want to nurture the art, you know. And but also the the um, the Art Museum of Southeast Texas that I mentioned, they have an um, an education department. A lot of people don't realize that either, but a lot of museums have an education department, and part of what they're their, their mission, really, is to make sure that art is accessible mm -hmm. to kids in the area. And so not only are they trying to bring people to the museum to see art, but they have these amazing spaces where the kids can go make art. So they do workshops and things at the museum of uh, the Art Museum of Southeast Texas. Um, also, there's a place called the Art Studio in town who does classes for both adults and kids. Really? And, yes, and okay. it's on Franklin Street, actually. So the Art Museum of Southeast Texas is on Main Street. Mm -hmm. The um, the art studio is on Franklin Street, and that's a private nonprofit group. Mm -hmm. And then there's also a place called the Beaumont Art League on Gulf Street, okay. uh, more north more north of uh, the freeway. They have classes as well. I don't know if they do classes for kids, but they do classes for like for adults and people of different ages and things. So there's really a lot of kind of things around town that can help students. And also now we got YouTube. Yes. You know, I mean, you know, right? Yes. So I was t working with a friend and we were just doing kind of at home drawing classes, mm -hmm. you know, and we were just looking on YouTube and, you know, some of the classes are better than others, okay? But there's some fantastic resources. Yes. You and you just know. type in how to draw. That's right. Yeah. And there's great, you know, and you might see, oh, I don't really know if this person's resonating with me but this mm -hmm. other person really does you know and so I think you know take advantage of the resources out there because we have the World Wide Web we can we, we again we can look at art anywhere in the world and yes. there's also a lot of um, you know schools and universities who are trying to make that content mm -hmm. available honestly I don't think that can ever substitute for in-person hands-on work you know but hey maybe if someone's taking art classes at their school your child is taking their mm -hmm. art classes with their art teacher. Maybe they want to also do something in the community or online sometime just to kind of see what's, what's other people there. are doing. And yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Um, and I just want to clarify that 
the Art Museum of Southeast Texas, the Art Studio, and Beaumont Art League are all located in Beaumont, Texas. They are. They are fantastic resources and the Dishman Art Museum as well. So, and that's right here on campus. So, you know, I moved to uh, Beaumont from Houston about eight years ago to work at Lamar. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure what to expect. You know, I kind of could tell the size of the city. It's a, it's a pretty significant size city, but I didn't know what to expect. And I've just been blown away by the amazing art community here. And not just visual art, but the arts community in general. Mm -hmm. But in visual art is fantastic. I mean, they're just, and there's almost always something going on. They, uh, you know, there's just cool events. I mean, there's, uh, there's what's this event? It's like the art of flowers, where people are like painting oh flowers, but then there's flower floral. That's a lot. Yeah, it is. And I don't know when that is. If that was recently, or if some things are in fall and some things are in spring. But there's a, there's really a lot a lot of cool things that people can do art related, and most of those things are free and open to the public. I mean, you know, classes and things you right. you, know, you have to pay usually. Uh, although I think some of the student, the some of the Classes for kids, though, I think are arranged with the schools, too. So there's different kinds of programs available. But a lot of the events are just free and fun. I mean, yeah. So In the spring, too, you know, the Beaumont Mural Festival is going on. And yes. I'm not involved in that, but I think it's fan I think it's great. I love and it. That's something new, correct? It's fairly new. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think, I guess maybe a few years. Um, but I think it's really great. I love murals, you know, because mm. it's just, you know, pub public art. It's there yes. for everyone. Uh, but they did a really cool thing last year. I don't know if that's going to happen again and again, but for people who weren't doing the full-scale murals, they did these cubes. I don't know if you saw them downtown. They were these big cubes. Yes. And they were in front of the art museum, and they had different artists come out, but I think they also had programs where kids who were doing the museum programs, they could go out there and paint. Like, I knew they were talking about having artists show kids, you know, that they could help paint. And mm -hmm. I mean, that's really empowering. Thing too, yeah, you know, to yeah. see that they, they, they could do something that's really cool and it's in the public space like that. So, yeah. What is your personal intention for art history? Well, okay, that has also been evolving over the years, I think, because okay. in the beginning, I really did kind of get pulled into art history because I wanted to understand why is it that a lot of the art we see may not seem beautiful or attractive like mm -hmm. by the standards I had learned growing up in looking at museum work or something. Right. So initially it was curiosity, you know, I wanted to see like what makes it art, like who who and how and how does all this, you know, become art. You know, mm -hmm. for example, there's one artist um, named Marcel Duchamp who he started just putting um, ordinary objects in and saying this is an artwork like a bicycle wheel. I know, That's see, I my, see my students do that and we have great conversations. So then, you know, we talk about these kinds of things and then we get to have these great conversations. You know, we get to hear like who thinks that's stupid and who thinks that's amazing yeah. and we can kind of have discussions about it and, and um, so, I, so then it kind of went into more of the discussions. Mm -hmm. You know, that became my reason, I guess. And now I think it's kind of expanded past that into thinking about how art history, whether someone's a studio major or maybe there's someone from any background who just wants to do um, take an art history class here mm -hmm. or something or do a minor in art history. I like to think about how art history can help enrich their understanding of the world, but also how it might open up doors for them. Whether it's in an art track or, um, I guess I didn't talk about this enough earlier, but I, I do think, I firmly believe actually, that learning a, at least a little bit about art history can help uh, many different fields. So if someone's in communications or history or uh, marketing, you know, uh, public relations, uh, I mean, there's just a lot of different areas where I think learning how to... Um, analyze and talk about or write about images or mm -hmm. objects can really help a lot, especially since we do see so many objects and images today, like images especially. We're looking at uh, internet imagery all the time now. We, you know, um, I remember when I was in art school, we were told that at that time, so I, I finished my PhD in 2015, and I remember hearing like even in, you know, around that time that we see more images today than 
someone living in the Middle Ages would have seen maybe in their entire lifetime. Okay. And that really put it in perspective for me. And that's even that's even been exponentially growing. That since would be then. because of like TV, TV and YouTube and, and yeah. technology. Right. Yes, right. Yeah. So, and, and YouTube is a great example. You can really see almost anything on there. Yeah. So, uh, but also we spend a lot of our screen time, right? Yeah. So, yeah, we e even if we're not watching traditional TV so much, we're still probably going on Netflix or something. Yes. And, and we're streaming some TV and maybe we're looking at things. I know for me, I'll look at, you know, look at the news, right? And I'm reading articles, but I'm also looking at a lot of the, the pictures, whether they're photographs or illustrations. Um, I have a student right now doing, um, she is going to, she's a double major, biology and art, which yeah. is kind of an interesting combination. Is. Says, what are you going to do? And she says, well, she wants to go to graduate school and become a medical illustrator, which I think is a fantastic. Oh, like in the books with the even heart. Thought of and the yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it's been, a, it's been around for a long time. And I think there, for a while there was some question about would it be replaced by just photography? And the answer is no, because they really need clear, there need to be clear illustrations. Uh, so that's an interesting career path. But the reason I mention it, it now is because she, I thought she was going to do her project on, you know, this history. And, and mm -hmm. she kind of is, like the history from, you know, even back in the 19th century. And, but what she's really using uh, is the coronavirus during the whole pandemic. We kept seeing those pictures, those, pictures. those illustrations of that virus yes. that looked like a big... With like stains. a big hairy monster, yes. spike, spike proteins everywhere. Yes. And, and so I thought it was fascinating that she's basically doing a paper on that how met this medical illustration of the coronavirus created our whole experience of the, of the pandemic. Really you know? So, yes. I mean, it really, it, it, it didn't create the experience, but it certainly focused it on that one image, you know, and I remember some people saying, I don't want to see that image ever again. And you know? it really put it in your face. <laughs> yeah, it really did. And it, and then so I think she's trying to also think about how powerful that medical illustration was when you combine it with internet and, and TV, and, you know, news coverage. And then the fact that it was shown over repetitively, repetitively. So, yeah, we look at a lot of images today, yeah. and I think that that now has become my reason for art history is to talk about how we can start now to talk about things like visual literacy mm -hmm. and I know there's you know we, we talk about literacy you know reading and reading and writing but also media literacy our communications department you know they teach courses in media literacy which I think okay. is you know really important to as well and now I think as an art historian I think that visual component of that thinking about how like um, I've had uh, students come up to me and say, I now realize that every time they show the villain in this series I've been watching, it, in that person's office in the background, they're showing a, a, a painting that it, you have been showing now has been from the, like, a painting of the Roman Empire that yeah. had a political context that was going on in the French Revolution. And, you know, they're like, now it, it opens up all these other levels of meaning they weren't picking up on in mm -hmm. that show before. So... To me, there's a lot of reasons now to be thinking about art history as a, not just something about the past, but something that's relevant for yeah. today. Yeah. Why is art so expensive? And <laughs> that's when, a good question. When did it become expensive? Oh, that's a good question, too. Yeah. That's a good, very good question. And, and you know, it, it is super expensive. It I is. mean, you know, and not all art is expensive. I should say, uh, right now, is it right now? Right now, or soon coming up, there will be, I think maybe there'll be the second Saturday of October, there's going to be a show at the Beaumont Art League okay. <laughs> called the $100 and Under Show. So there's like artists who are deliberately putting in works that could sell for and be o available to a wide range of, you know, even college students maybe yeah. in some cases, you know. Um, but... Um, thinking about price, I mean, part of the idea about price value in terms mm -hmm. of, of cost uh, is that a lot of artwork especially we can go back thousands of years on this now especially artwork that was being created for religious reasons would have often been being created with the finest materials available okay. um, and so we're you're talking gold you're talking marble you're talking things okay. that, that that have you know they've been at least they've been invested with this idea that they're worth a lot, right, and mm -hmm. monetarily. 
Um, and then also that carried through into the political context as well. I mean, um, our other art historian here, she teaches about the history of collecting, and she goes all the way back to, like, the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans were collecting art. Well, who were those collect? A lot of times there's a lot of, um, that's a whole other conversation, but a lot of times those early collections really had to do with violence and, you know, people who are invading parts of the world. And stealing. And, and stealing the objects, okay. yes. And that hasn't stopped, right? That mm -hmm. still happens. Um, but a lot of the times the early political sort of leaders, and we're talking like emperors and kings and queens, they were trying to use art to sort of bolster their regime and to show how, you know, Important. they were so powerful. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How powerful and important they yes. were. So they were they were amassing more and more of these objects, and then that I think that, in addition to the fact that the materials cost a lot, mm -hmm. that also put that prestige value. You know, um, there's a lot of <laughs> manipulation going on with that. But then also, and then closer into our part of history, like say, um, especially like since the middle of the 19th century, up until today, is when we started to see the emergence of. Um, art galleries where you have like a whole gallery system that that not only exhibits art but also I guess the what I should say is the difference between a gallery and a museum is that most of the time an art gallery is trying to sell art whereas a museum is often trying to preserve art and culture and then put it on view for people to see to try to okay. make it more democratically available to people so it's not just in those collections where <laughs> yeah so um, but then um, the art galleries become these places sometimes where then you know like if you go to New York City you're gonna see yes. galleries and, and you know, even go to Houston. I mean, go. You're going to see work selling for not only thousands, but sometimes millions of dollars. Yes. And that is a whole other. There's a whole kind of history on just that kind of collecting. Mm -hmm. I don't spend. That's not a big, a huge focus for me. But uh, that is something that sometimes artists themselves uh, explore in their work, and sometimes they even kind of make fun of it. I mean, recently, I guess. I lose track of recently nowadays, but I think like maybe sometime within the past few years, uh, there's a, a, a graffiti artist named, he goes by the tag, he's B Banksy, I don't know if any of you I've never heard of him. Well, it's, it's very, it's a very interesting and kind of gimmicky thing because the idea is he's anonymous. Okay. Because he's a, he was a graffiti artist. Mm -hmm. So he, he goes by Banksy, so he can be anonymous. But yet, as Banksy, he's one of the most famous artists in the world. So he's not but anonymous. They don't know, like, who this person is necessarily, but they do. He's famous. It's, he's famous and anonymous. It's very strange. Okay. But he did this work that was really, I mean, again, this is going to be in the history books as being uh, a fantastic artistic gesture that people... Mm -hmm really, really hate or is talking about this guy. And he goes by the name of Banksy. And How do you spell that? Uh, I think it's just B-A-N-K-S-Y. Okay. He's a graffiti artist. And you'll actually, now that I've told you about him, you'll start to see his... I just was watching a show and there was at the end of it one of his pieces. But, um, okay, the reason I mention this is because he's one of... There are many other artists who have kind of challenged this idea that art... It, it starts to get this idea... This idea where it becomes almost on this high pedestal, it's so yes. expensive, uh, and then is it more about the money and less about the art? You know, at what point does it get dis disengaged from creative work? Mm -hmm. And so what Banksy did was he uh, had a work that he put up, this work went up for auction, and people, someone bid on it for millions and millions of dollars, and as soon as the bidding closed, there was like a shredder attached to it, and it just shredded the work. No, <laughs> there's a there vid, there's video of it, and it was yeah, it's it's pretty over the top. But you know, it kind of comes to this idea is like people are sitting here literally bidding millions and millions and millions of dollars on these artworks, and when you start talking about works like Picasso paintings or Leonardo da Vinci paintings, mm -hmm. sometimes you know you could be talking like. 80 million dollars. I mean, yes. you know, I mean, there's just more, 120, you know, yes. I mean, there's just lots of money being spent on art. And so, you know, that, that whole idea is, is it so expensive it's just out of touch? And yeah, and then there's a whole range, right? Then there's people who are making art because they want it to be available. Mm -hmm. to, they want it to be available to the public. So, who gets to say, yeah. or who gets to pick exactly? Yeah. You know, I'm going <laughs> yeah, with this. Yeah. Who gets to say or who gets to point and say, 
that's going to be the it art of the mm. twin the twentieth generation. Yeah. And it's gonna be fifty mil like who yeah. gets who is this person yeah. with all of this power? It's a lot of power, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so that that is a, a great question. I mean, you know, I think in some of those cases it's a cumulative effect. Mm -hmm. Um, but it kind of starts, I think it starts in the small spaces and works its way up. So I think that's why in, in a lot of um, my classes for, for art history, I like to talk about, like, why are we talking about some of these artists? Mm -hmm. You know, what are the cultural reasons why certain artists are being discussed and some of them are not, right? right. And we know that in the past sometimes that has been due to discriminatory practices. Um, and I think a lot of that has improved. It certainly hasn't been solved. I mean, there's still many issues. But then when it comes to that question about those high value, like the sort of really, really over the top expensive artworks, I think that can be coming from the gallery system itself. A lot of times it can be coming from art critics who are okay. writing, you know, oh, this is the most fantastic art, you know, that we've, we've seen in a century or something, you know, and then um, but it, a lot of times there has to be something to it that is really getting people's attention in a, in a very interesting way. And then um, value in that sense. Also, you know, there's a market value and that is, economics is not my strong point, but what I will say is even when we're talking about things like college degrees or mm -hmm. buying a car or something, it gets to a point where the market is just kind of it goes up, 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 and next thing you know, this is the realm where the prices yeah. are. Um, but also those prices do go up and down. I know during the 1980s there were, um, actually during the 1980s there were a lot of graffiti artists mm -hmm. who um, started to have their work, you know, instead of just being on subway cars in New York City, now you start to have them being shown in these very lucrative galleries. When at first you were money. getting arrested for that. Exactly, exactly. Now you can get paid yeah. for it. Yeah, so really one of the most significant artists of the 1980s, uh, probably the later 20th century altogether, is an artist named Jean-Michel Basquiat, and he was working in New York City as a graffiti artist, and he's he's really, like, I would say the top person who started to really get that really sort of uh, street art, you know, mm -hmm. um, where it maybe looks like it came straight off of a wall, a graffiti wall, put it into a gallery. Um, the other thing about Basquiat is that he also was one of the first African-American artists to really get into that 1980s high, high, I mean, you know, lots of money sort okay. of gallery scene. But I think what's kind of interesting when we talk about him in our class is he also was doing a lot to cultivate his image as an artist. So to kind of say, like, you know, he was using graffiti to deal with social issues, right? And, and for him, a lot of times it... Maybe not have to do, it would have to sometimes do with race, but also in his case, a hybrid identity, having uh, parents with different backgrounds and then different, um, you know, how he saw himself as fitting um, into this sort of art world he was trying to break into. Um, but then he starts taking in kind of cultivating that image in a way that it becomes his own brand, right? And then he's now, he's got a brand, and then his art becomes very, very sought after and still is today. I mean. Uh, tragically, he died at a very young age, so oh, okay. we couldn't really see how much further that might have gone. But um, I think that was an interesting thing because it brought up that question about value and cost, right? Value in terms of cultural value and value in terms of monetary value and how sometimes there might seem a, a complete gap between the two, mm -hmm. but then other times they may be brought together. And then sometimes they can be brought together in ways that are kind of shocking to people. Because, I mean, there were a lot of people saying, like, why is graffiti art? being sold in the gallery, you know, yeah. and now it's like one of the most popular art it forms. Is. Yeah, you know, people really are excited about it. it so, is. Yeah. What, um, what makes art so special that it can communicate? I feel like mm -hmm. art can communicate with everyone and yeah. anyone, regardless of age or race or background, yeah. and yet, for the most part, it doesn't use any words. Mm, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Basquiat actually did put words in his <laughs> mm -hmm. um, And so sometimes it does, but a lot of times uh, those words are not being used because they're trying to communicate with the words in terms of verbally. A lot of times the words are still being used visually. You know what I mean? Yes. I think for Basquiat sometimes 
the word the words did have meaning verbally as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, for the most part, we're trying to communicate with images, right, or or some kind of material properties. Um, and I will say that not all art does resonate with everyone because a lot of times I, I'm showing work that people think is kind of weird. Like if I show a bicycle wheel mm -hmm. or a tire, we one artist we actually one artist we talk about is named Robert Rauschenberg. He is one of the most important artists of the 20th century as well, and he's from Port Arthur, Texas, actually. What? Yeah. Um, he uh, is was, he still alive? No, he's not. But okay. he when he was, he would sometimes come here occasionally. You know. Um, like in, in, he was doing a lot of work in the, uh, especially in the 1950s, 60s, mm -hmm. and through into the 80s. And, but he um, did one work that he made by having some, by, by putting paper on the ground and having a car tire that drive through mm -hmm. uh, paint and then drive across this paper just to create a really long straight line. And, you know, a lot of people would say they'd make that face. <laughs> they'd be like, how is that art, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it's funny because. I think art can resonate with everyone in a sense because mm -hmm. all people are are creative in some way or have been right. creative at least when they were kids or something. Um, and I also think art is a great way to learn about cultures around the world and historical periods. Maybe art from you know thousands of years ago or something. I get fascinated when I look at Stonehenge or maybe like actually all around the world. There's artwork created in caves, you know. Mm -hmm. And that fascinates me, you know, this art created in caves all around the world, mm -hmm. all, literally, all, I think every continent has that artwork in it. Yes. I mean, I don't know about Antarctica, but we can't see there, but, you know, um, yeah, that fascinates me, and so I think in that sense it really, it, you know, that art can communicate, even if it's, even if you don't understand it and it seems really mysterious. Like some of those art on those caves from so many thousands of years ago, we can't really relate so much to how people may have lived back then. I know some of them have uh, handprints, and mm -hmm. to me that always seems a little bit haunting and kind of strange, but also like, it's a handprint, you know, you can, we can all relate to that in a way, right? Yes. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure I can really answer that question, but I do think your, you know, I think your question was how does it do that, right? How, how, do, how that? does it do that? You know, I'm not sure, honestly, mm -hmm. I'm really not, but I just do think that, um, you know, there are studies about, again, about cognitive uh, cognition, and sometimes when we're talking about that really, really early cave or rock art, or art that's being created on, you know, rocky cliffs and things like that, that uh, um, archaeologists and anthropologists, you know, they discuss that work sometimes as evidence of early cognitive abilities, you know, the mm -hmm. fact that it's an impetus not only to create something, but to communicate something. Mm -hmm. So, um, but then I think what is kind of interesting to me is what, to me, this is a question I can't even really answer. We, we talk about this question a lot mm -hmm. in class, but, you know, is how does art communicate with you even if it's not clear what it's trying to communicate, right. you know, even if it is from a whole other culture, a whole other time period mm -hmm. that you maybe have never seen before. Does it still communicate with you even though you're in a totally different Context. I would it say kinda, yes. Yeah, I think it kind of does. Yeah, too. I would but it's say just yes. not. We're not always sure how, how? or why. Yeah. yeah. But to me, that's part of that mystery. That's mm -hmm. kind of fun to explain. And even in the the confusion yeah. that's communicating. Yeah, as I well. think so. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Or yeah. the weirdness, or the bicycle tire that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's still communicating. Yeah. Um, why do you think art history should matter? Um, well, I think it should matter for all of the things we've just been talking about, mm -hmm. uh, but also, so for me, even the, 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 the idea of, you know, how art might communicate, mm -hmm. uh, what, an, what an art historian wants to do is to try to understand that. And so what we do is, the tools that we have, we, we do visual analysis of a work of art, and mm -hmm. um, that could be something about, like, what it looks like, how it looks like it was made or might have been made. Uh, like so what kind of colors, what kind of size, what kind of materials. Um, but then we also try to look at, you know, what what else can I learn about that? Is there some historical documentation I could find? Like is maybe there's newspaper articles or, you know, archives somewhere in a library or over even oral histories or, you know, um, or are there other cultural 
elements that may relate to that. And so for me, um, it does kind of help us to understand, you know, a multicultural world. Uh, so I think, you know, whether we're talking about art from the distant past or, or art that's contemporary or maybe just made, I don't know, maybe you know, 20 years ago or something, where, uh, you know, it helps us learn more about each other. And, and then also this digital age that we're in now, too. I think that our history matters a lot now because I do think it's important to, to think about the idea that we, we should know, we, we want to be critical viewers, and I don't mean like critical as in against, but like we're critically thinking about what we see, because if you're, if we just receive images passively like on TV or, you know, whether it's Netflix or whatever, um, that data is going in, you know, and we want to be able to kind of stop and think about it. So I think art history matters a lot because it helps people to learn how to analyze what they're seeing and also to place it in a historical context, maybe, to learn more about that, to enrich that, um, to learn more about ourselves and other people, but also to be mindful about what we're seeing and consuming in our media. Do you think art history is one of the best ways to look at our past and see our past? I definitely do, yeah. <laughs> Especially if we're talking about, look, and, and that's funny too, uh, because even the choice of words there, um, mm -hmm. and we talk about this in my classes too, a lot of the time. I feel like I need to come to your class. Uh, well, you know what? I actually, I'm, well, I'm happy if people want to sit in on a uh, class. That, that happens sometimes. Okay. So you are welcome to come sit Thank in you. class. Or sometimes I'll tell people, uh, I've had people talk about maybe we should uh, consider doing a, um, workshops or something, you know, just like a, we do talks, but maybe we could do talks that are more like just an informal class yes. kind of setting where we can uh, look at pictures and mm -hmm. talk about things. Um, but we often, in the, in the history of English language anyway, and I think a lot of other languages too, I know it's the same with French, but, you know, we use the words looking and seeing to equate it with knowledge and knowing. Mm -hmm. And so, if we're gonna look at the art of the past, uh, uh, we're gonna look at the past. Um, then why not use the images and objects we can actually look at mm -hmm. with our eyes? You know, and, we, and that can definitely enrich the things we're learning about through through narratives that we're hearing about or reading as well. Yeah. Where do you see art in the next 10, 20 years? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of interesting direction art is going right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were talking earlier about our students and our faculty exploring, you know, digital, uh, just just technological innovations. Mm -hmm. Certainly, AI is a big one. We yes. I mean, we're just touching the surface of that right now. Yes. One of our um, professors is going to give a talk on the use of AI in art, uh, just coming up in a, here in a, a, a few weeks, I think. Um, we also. Uh, you know, we're working on things like 3D printing, mm -hmm. and I think when we look forward, we can see that those kinds of technologies are just going to, they're going to become more sophisticated, and there's going to be more of those kinds of technologies, and we want, you know, what artists are going to want to do is to creatively explore uh, what are going to, what are going to be the new boundaries of those yeah. technologies, yeah, so, yeah, I think just, we're going to see more and more art and technology. As we get ready to wrap up this interview, the entire time I get, I feel like I could feel your oh. passion oh, that's for good. art <laughs> and art history and the excitement and the love that you have for it. What are some like fun, exciting mm -hmm. things for art and art history for you personally? Okay, well that's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm glad. To, I'm glad to hear that. That means a lot to me. Uh, so fun things in terms of like the kinds of things, the, the kinds of projects I like to work on, or uh, yeah, like a, whatever you wanna. Okay, so um, so in addition to teaching, you know, mm -hmm. most of the faculty at Lamar and other universities were also doing research, and then we're usually publishing that work. And so um, I do really love going to museums, and for me, that's part of my research. Okay. Um, but I also do go to archives. I look in arch like so. I'll sometimes. You know, uh, one tr one example is um, a trip to the Art Institute in Chicago and going to their ar archives, and I get to pull out a box of materials that actually belong to an artist that I was studying. And I can kind of see, oh, these were the magazine clippings that he had, and you know, oh, it makes sense because maybe he was exhibiting work at that time, or you know, something like that. So I have a lot of fun doing that kind of research where I'm looking, but I'm also 
reading. Um, you know, there, there used to be a show on PBS. I'm not sure if it's still on, but it was mm -hmm. called History Detectives. <laughs> And I love I that think, show. I haven't Have seen, seen it. It was it was so fun because it was a group of they were historians, not art historians, but they would someone would say to them, "Hey, I found this um, artifact in my grandmother's attic." And sometimes it might be you know a toy or something. Other times it might be a painting or a photograph or a, a newspaper or something. And these history detectives would go and do this research to find out was it worth a lot of money? Was it historically significant? Or not, you know, kind of to your question earlier. And to me, that is kind of a fun thing because you kind of go into detective mode. Mm -hmm. When we start doing research, we're looking on the internet, we're taking trips, you know, we're going to, you know, maybe Paris or New York or someplace to look at art. And um, one of the most fun things I ever did was go to the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, mm -hmm. uh, which I sometimes go there but in this case when I was a graduate student I was able to get permission for them to take me into their storage area which was so fun because it was a whole warehouse actually in Queens and the whole place was just full of all of these artworks that were stored and they they pulled this artwork out for me to see like look at it up close and I could see like all the bumps the the grooves of the paint and everything and so Were that stuff is fun it? for me. No, they won't let me touch it. <laughs> they never let you touch it. But actually, sometimes the, in the some of the print and drawing collections, you can uh, wear gloves and handle oh, like okay. a, maybe a, an old uh, maybe a magazine from the 1920s mm -hmm. or something like that. So and now we have the internet. Sometimes when I'm doing research, I can go on there and buy one of the very mat. Like I'm looking at sometimes a. I need a photo from a journal that came out in June 1931, and I can go online and b just buy it. Someone has it, and I just get it shipped to me, and that's really fun. Yeah. So I have fun doing that, and I also I do publish articles mm -hmm. uh, and books. One of the things I love to do is um, I'm a writer for um, a website called Smart History, and that's just that's actually an, um, I think it's a fun one for anyone who might be interested in any kind of art. Or creative work. It's it's an educational website, and it's it's just you know a free open website where you can find short articles and videos mm -hmm. that are done by art historians that are specializing in that field. So okay. if someone's doing, if you want to know more about the Harlem Renaissance, or you want to know more about the French Impressionists, you can go on there, and there'll be sh really high quality work by someone who's an expert in that field, maybe an art historian um, who's teaching, or maybe someone who's a curator in a museum. And they will, uh, and again, art from all around the world too. So you can learn, even when I'm teaching, sometimes I'll go on there because I'll be like, okay, I know I have books and I'm reading this, mm -hmm. but I just want to see a short video by someone who's an expert in this in a fun, engaging way. And they're yes. going to go talk about, you know, um, Sometimes the video will be from museums from around the world, too. You can kind of get a sense of what would it be like to visit that museum. Oh, wow. So it's kind of fun. It's awesome. Okay, so as we are getting ready to wrap up, tell me about this book. Um, now, did you write the book? Um, well, thank you. Yes. Let me hold it up. So yeah, thank see. you. Yeah, so uh, this book, and uh, so this is actually collectively written by the Department of Art and Design here. So um, I co edited the book with the uh, uh, Donna M. Meeks, who was the chair of the department at that time, and most of our faculty contributed chapters to the book. Uh, we also featured student artworks in the book, um, and also alumni artworks in the book. So uh, it's called Art as Living Practice because we wanted to really talk about that, how art is very relevant and it matters today. Uh, we have it in the, in the image on the front is actually a digital, you know, we're looking at art and technology. It's this okay. art being um, created, right, 3D printed. Um, but um, we actually expanded the title now to Art as Living Practice Southeast Texas and Beyond because there's a lot of focus on the art of Southeast Texas because what we want, and this is mainly for art appreciation students, okay. but also for our, some of our own majors, what we want to do is to let people who live in Southeast Texas know that there's a lot of great art being made here today and there's also a rich history of art being produced. You would not believe how many amazing artists are from Southeast Texas. There's just a lot of great work. That, that, and then we want people to know that there's places you can go and see it for little or no cost at all, usually free, and that, you know, it's fun and it's a resource for, for everyone in our community. So. If my viewers and my audience want to purchase this book, 
how can they do that? Oh, yes, that's interesting. Now, thank you. You know, it's funny because this is one book I wasn't actually trying to sell. <laughs> but um, we do, we, um, it is for sale. Uh, this mm -hmm. is um, a Kindle Hunt, and it can be purchased on the Kindle Hunt website. So, okay. yeah, um, and that's great. And I should say, since we wrote this collectively, our author, all of our authors and editors, we, we actually, any money that's made from this book goes to the Department of Art and Design Fund for student activities like field trips to go to Houston to look at art. So we, uh, we, anybody who buys this book, you're putting a little bit of money into the Department of Art and Design student's pocket because we just said, hey, you know what, this is a labor of love. Mm -hmm. We are just going to, there's so many authors, there's I think 12 or 13 of us, uh, and even local museums helped okay. and contribute to it. So we just said, you know, all the royalties go to art students. Yeah. Very good. Where well, you can learn and invest. In the yeah, future. that's right. Into the future of learn art in Southeast Texas. Learn and invest in the future that's of right. Southeast yeah. Texas. Yeah. For my final question, Dr. Chadwick, who do you think would make a great guest on my podcast, but you have to help me get them on? I love that question. Um, okay, so, and I, I can make two recommendations? Yes, you can. I have two recommendations, and I think these are both artists who are doing all the kinds of things we've been talking about here in terms of uh, asking those questions about value and access and, you know, who gets to decide what art we are, we are looking yes. at. And, and who, you know, how can we do more to uh, open up access and to empower uh, art, not only art students, but just anyone who's interested to, to have more of a voice or more of an image in that process. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first artist I want to recommend is named, his name is Andre Ramos Woodard. And do you want me to say anything about this person? Oh, background? sure. Okay. Sure. So um, Andre graduated from Lamar in 2017. Okay. And he is, a um, well, a, primarily a photographer, started off in photography, and then started to also combine drawing and photography. And um, most of his current work is dealing with the history of racism in American cartoons. But he combines that interest with his sense of, of, um, of home, of identity, and um, self-portraiture, and also portraits generally, and family photos and things. So okay. fantastic work. And I should say he has work already that's already been purchased by the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. And he's already had work on view at that museum, which is an amazing accomplishment for okay. someone who, uh, I mean, he graduated here in 2017 and then earned his master's degree from the University of New Mexico. But that's an amazing accomplishment. Uh, the other person is also one of our former graduates, uh, alumna, uh, alumnus from 2017 named Gonzalo Alvarez. And he was asking himself, why is it that he, he loves, um, well, he became interested in comics and graphic art, so doing the kinds of illustrations for that kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, and he was asking himself, why does he not see more uh, comic art and other art that's reflecting uh, his own background mm -hmm. growing up in Texas with parents who came to Texas from Mexico. Right. And so he's uh, working on a series of graphic novels right now that is being published uh, based on um, Mexican and Mexican American folklore, but also using Aztec kind of uh, art art in the work. Yes. And he also has created a game that students can play in classes learning um, learning more about Mesoamerican culture. So yeah, I think those are both fantastic candidates, and I believe that we will get them on your podcast. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm excited to meet and learn from both of those young gentlemen. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty awesome. That's going to be good. Thank you so much, Dr. Chadwood, for sitting down and talking to me and educating me about art and art history and really just showing that it is not a dying thing. It is right. still very much living, very much present, and still yeah. affecting our everyday, oh, yeah. our everyday yeah. lives. So oh. thank you. Well, thank you, and thank you for having me on. This has been a really fun experience, and it's, I love talking about art and art history. So <laughs> I can tell. It's a great opportunity. For me. I can tell. And thank you so much for tuning in and watching and listening. Do not hit the end button because Dr. Chadwood says she's going to give me a brief tour of the art department, so I'll make sure and take some pictures so you can go on tour with us. So stay tuned. But... I would like to thank you so much for watching. 
you can get this podcast and all of my other podcasts on YouTube Podcasts and Apple Podcasts. And remember, you always have time to listen and learn on the go.